Good evening, and Merry Christmas. It is wonderful to see you this evening. Welcome to St. Peter's Christmas Eve candlelight service. Tonight we're going to have carols that we're going to sing. We're going to uh, hear some lessons from Scripture, and we'll have a candlelighting portion of the service at the end of our service tonight. And while I know that tonight our Christmas Eve will be slightly different from others in the past, and things are just kind of different everywhere, Uh, What I want to remind us is that God is still here, that God is still good, and God is always with us. And tonight we will celebrate uh, the presence of God. And our prayer this evening is that we can make room for the space of God in our lives. And so tonight we're going to ask you just a few things to to help us in this uh, um, COVID experiment, I guess, that we're in and experience, is that one, we ask that you do remain socially distanced and stay with the pods that you came from. What's that old song? Love the one you're with or come with the one you're with. Go home with the one you dance with. I don't even know anymore, but... uh, Probably not the one Jim wanted me to share right there, huh? <laughs> um, but uh, sit with the one you're with. And, uh, um, but we also ask that after the service, you move your holiday cheer conversations to our St. Peter's Square out, outside. And, and, uh, um, and uh, we also ask that uh, your cell phones re- remain off. If you do, by chance, have learn what our password to our Wi-Fi is and use that from time to time. We ask that you would uh, disconnect from the Wi-Fi. If you need to use your cell service, that's all right. But uh, um, the Wi-Fi is we keep a, a nice streaming service for those that, who are at, at home uh, streaming with us this evening. Um, we do have uh, restrooms that are outside and, and down the corner. And we also ask that you keep your mask on for the, uh, the entirety of service until you get outside. Um, there will be singing so we can sing, but from behind our mask. I know that can be difficult as we have done that. Um, for two services now, um, and so, but we uh, do, that's all the rules that I have. We're so glad that you are with us and that you're here, whether you're online or in, in this space, that we can worship Jesus Christ this evening, and uh, um, if you're new new to our church in this area, we do have services on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and we live stream um, that as well, in person or live stream, and now... I invite us to move with the Holy Spirit through our service, listen for the words of Jesus in this moment, and look for life to happen with us today. Oh, I do have one more thing to say. During the candlelight service, um, there's going to be a portion at the end when we're singing Silent Night, and I'll light the the Christ candle, and I'll take the light from the Christ candle to light the ushers, and they'll they'll spread that cheer um, and throughout. But what we ask is if your candle is lit, that your candle that is lit stay upright. The unlit candle can go um, uh, sideways. And the reason is, is if your lit candle is sideways, where does the wax go? It goes on our neighbors or on your lap or on the pew. We don't want that. I don't, I don't think. And, uh, um, and so we ask that you remain that, uh, at, at that way, just a helpful reminder. But let us remember that Jesus Christ is here in this space, and he loves us. Hear these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. As we seek the light, as the darkness grows bright, as the wonder of Christmas draws near, oh come, oh come, Emmanuel, and joy. Advent, 
God's wondrous gift. O come, let us adore him. During Advent, we stood in awe of God's saving grace. O come, let us adore him. During Advent, we recalled the promise of God's spoken word. O come, let us adore him. During Advent, we waited for the time of God's glorious arrival. O come, let us adore him. Tonight, our waiting is over. Our eyes are open. Gift is given. O oh, come, let us adore him. There is wonder in the hope of the birth of the king. There is wonder in the sound of the angels as they sing oh come oh come Emmanuel and join us here. would you stand and join us in our opening hymn oh come all ye faithful Isaiah 11, verse 1 through 5. A green shoot will sprout from Jesse's stump, from his roots a budding branch. The life-giving Spirit of God will hover over him, the Spirit that brings wisdom and understanding. He won't judge by appearances, won't decide on the basis of hearsay. He'll judge the needy by what is right, render decision on earth's poor with justice. His words will bring everyone to all attention. A mere breath from his lips will topple the wicked. Each morning he'll pull on sturdy work clothes and boots and build righteousness and faithfulness in the land. Israel was not lost. They were alone. Times were dark and desperate. They were disconnected and longed for better days. What should salvation look like? The promise of life was there. 
They trusted, but how long would it take? How long would they have to wait? 2,000 years ago in an obscure town, darkness began to quake as that light and the promise stirred and began to break through the cracks of desperation. We may have moments of wondering about God's promise and if life can be had. Remember, in our darkest moments, God's light shines brightest and life can fill our lungs once more. We light this candle as a symbol of hope. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Luke 1, verses 26 through 35 and 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Ordinary. In ordinary town, in ordinary village, in ordinary girl, are visited by an unusual visitor. But even as out of the ordinary it is to be visited by an angel, what was more extraordinary was the message. God's silence is broken, his new creation begun, in an ordinary girl, in an ordinary village, in an ordinary town. Our lives can feel distant from the extraordinary, distant from the divine, and distant from love. But it is love that came down, it is love that is here with us. It is love that God gave his only son. We light this candle as a symbol of love. May we know the presence of God's love in our life today.
did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? reading from Luke 2 verses 1 to 7. In those days the decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Cornelius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. As she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Something amazing was happening to this young couple and to the world. But the world was busy. The world was loud. The world was demanding. Would they hear the new cry of life? Would they see where true joy comes from? There are many things in this life that attempt to rob us of joy. But life is not found in the noise. It is found in the whisper of the Holy Spirit. We light this candle as a symbol of the joy in the presence of Jesus. May we know God's joy in our life.
Jesus Christ came to be present with us to draw all people to himself, that we might all be united with God. And this is called discipleship, that Jesus Christ came not to make converts, but to make disciples, and a disciple is one who follows Christ. And how do we know that? How do we know which way to go if we don't evaluate our lives? And so we ask three questions each week. It's a part of our offering and offering ourselves up to God. God, who are you calling me to be? Where are you calling me to go? And what are you calling me to give? And if we pay attention to not just the questions, but the one who can answer them, and then have the courage to follow the places God leads, we might see a transformed life. And so we offer ourselves at St. Peter's as a community to one another in order to offer ourselves to God that we might be a place that reflects the kingdom of God. And so we do that as as well with our prayers, our presence, our our gifts, our service, and we do that through our our tithes and offering. And so when we offer, we are offering to uh, create spaces in which we can grow and our transformation. And so we, we do look and ask if you are looking for end of year giving and as well as offering yourself up to, to one another to, um, to the ministries here at our St. Peter's Church. We have different ways to do that. One is you can mail in. Uh, two, you can go to our website and uh, there's a link there to, to click on. And if you're online, you can also text to give as well as um, we do Venmo and PayPal. And here, if you're looking to, to make an offering, uh, while we're not passing out offering um, uh, baskets uh, because of COVID, we do have our offering uh, boxes in the back of the church, and I believe we'll have a place in, um, there that you can drop your offerings off on the way out. But the big part is not in the amount, but is in paying attention to who God is calling you to be, where God is calling you to go, and what is God calling you to give, and to be obedient to the discipleship that he calls you into. And so... Let us offer ourselves this evening and let us, during this next song, be a place where we can um, meditate on who God is in our life. So brightly shining, it is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error. Gospel is peace. 
chain shall he break for the slave is a brother and in his name all oppression shall cease sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise me let all within us praise his holy verses 8 to 16. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. The shepherds, rugged, rough outsiders, and mistrusted often struggled to know peace. But surrounding them with light, angels brought them a message that they could know this peace and be a people who could share peace. Does peace seem far away for you? Does it seem unlikely in your life? Hear the good news. Just as peace came to those shepherds, peace is offered to you. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of God's Holy Spirit overcome you with peace.
Please be seated. The gospel reading for this evening is from Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the census that was taken before Quirinus was governor of Syria. And all went to their own towns to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, because he belonged to the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room in the guest room. This is God's word. Ready? You guys? I mean, it's Christmas Eve. You excited? All right. Me too. It's my favorite, favorite time of the year. I, it's like you rush all year to get here, and then you want to slow down. Slow down. And then, uh, and because I, I don't like the next few days after Christmas. <laughs> I like this block of time and just to take a breath. And there's a, there's a phrase that comes up quite a bit is, uh, um, did you save room? Is there, you got any room left? 
And he, he, usually after dinner, you've had a big feast, and maybe someone says, well, we got pie. And there's always room for pie and uh, cake and cookies, and that, which I've been eating way too much of. If, if my COVID weight wasn't bad enough, now I'm going to have Christmas weight. And the problem is when there's only two of you in the household, just me and my daughter, Sydney, that one pumpkin pie, that's a lot of, that's a lot of calories. But there's always room. But that's the thing. Growing up, um, my family, we would always go up to uh, the, the queen mother of all, uh, do you have room left? My grandmother, who was a food pusher, um, it was, she was a fantastic food pusher. As a matter of fact, if you told her no, she often has for breakfast. I remember taking my friend, um, happened to be with me on one of my trips. They, so my, my parents were from Mississippi. I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and we go there every, every winter and every summer. And, and my friend went once, and we get up and get breakfast. We got a bowl of cereal. My grandmother, you want some sausage and eggs and bacon? We're like, no, no, no. You want some oatmeal? You know, um, and, you know in next, we would say, no, but you know what happened. We eat our cereal and then there'd be a plate of sausage, eggs, and bacon, and biscuits, and we ate that. We had room. And, uh, but we would go up there every Christmas, and it was fantastic. Uh, we involved traveling, going out of state, and what was great about going to Mississippi was there was all the families. I'd see relatives I'd only see twice a year. I'd see um, which my, my grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles, and I'm an only child. It was just the three of us in, in Jacksonville, so this was quite a treat. The other thing was is you got seasons up, up there, uh, um, and... Uh, uh, we actually have to wear sweaters and jackets and sometimes even gloves and hats um, when you actually had a reason for it. I know we wear them here, but it's really not as cold as we think it is. The rest of the world kind of mocks us. And uh, um, so we go up there and, and have these great Christmases, and it was wonderful for an only child. Lots of family, lots of family. Being the youngest child meant lots of gifts. And uh, we all know that's what Christmas is about. Um, and that's sarcasm. So uh, we would go up there, but one year, my family, my parents, who were probably watching at this service online, um, decided we're going to invite all the family to come to Florida. And so we invited five families to come stay at our three-bedroom house in Florida. If you've seen Christmas Vacation, all the family that shows up, it was like that. We were the Griswolds, and uh, it, it went about as well as that. Um, but we... Five new families, in addition to our family, in, in the three-bedroom house. That meant that I got kicked out of my room. I didn't get to go to the be- guest bedroom. I didn't even get to go to the couch that was a pull-out couch that had the bar across with the, the flimsy mattress. That um, Do you remember, the, especially in the, in the 70s and 80s, and they were just awful. Um, but, and, uh, so I didn't even get that. Um, my parents, my dad came up with the idea and says, you know, we have a pop-up camper. Now, it wasn't, you know, we have a pop-up camper. We'll take it to a campground and you can stay there. It wasn't, no, we have a pop-up camper and we'll park it in front of the house and you can stay out there because they didn't want to do that because they didn't want in our suburban neighborhood, they frowned upon pop-up campers in the front yard. And uh, um, no, it was, we can put the pop-up camper in our garage in Florida it smelled like gasoline, lawn clippings, and garbage in, the, in a garage. You know, it was basically, it was a garage. So basically what my parents said is, look, we know that you're the youngest, and we're going to treat you um, much like a, uh, our pets. We'll put you out, <laughs> out of the house for the, for the winter. You can go sleep outside tonight. And so uh, um, it was just, it was awful. And so, well... Um, I know my life was tortured, and you're, you're, you hear that. Uh, um, so while Ma and her kerchief and Pa and his cap settled down for their long winter's nap, I was out in the garage with the cat. And uh, um, so when everyone fell asleep, I snuck back inside. And uh, I, just, I found one couch that wasn't a fold-out couch. It was just a sliver of cushion, and I slept there for the night in the air condition. I wasn't going to stay out. But one thing that my family did is they made room. There was room for one more. They always want to make sure, no, no, there's always plenty. There's plenty. Please come, come. And so there, we made room for family to stay together, and it was a pretty fun Christmas um, inside. But the story of Christmas is a story about making room. That's really what it's about. And, um, and so I want to tell you a little the story again. You've heard it. You hear it every year. It's good to hear it again. 
And, but I want to point out some things that sometimes we get a little bit wrong and, uh, or we miss. It's misinformation. I'm just going to add to the story a little bit and adjust as we go along. It's a beautiful story, and it's been created about the night that Jesus was born. And, but there's been a few missing pieces. One of my professors in seminary, his name is Dr. Ben Witherington III, and uh, um, he's a renowned scholar. Uh, sometimes if you're watching one of the, uh, the History Channel or something, he's one of the guys they'd go to, but he's written books. He doesn't have an unpublished thought, and uh, um, he's quite a, a brilliant theologian, and he wrote this article slash sermon um, about, about this evening, and, uh, and I want to share some of that tonight. So we have the tale of a girl, a young girl, who was visited by an angel, and this angel came and told her, says, behold, you're pregnant with God's child. And then she had to go tell her fiancé, Joseph, she's betrothed to, say, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Joseph's going to go, uh-huh, <laughs> and, uh, well, it's not yours, obviously, Joseph, because um, we're not married and the way the arrangements went. And, and he says, all right, well, who's the other guy? Well, it's God. Now, I can't believe that he made it as far as he did. Um, but he decided, okay, I'm not really going to buy this whole story, but you're pregnant, um, it's not mine, we're betrothed, so we're going to call the wedding off. But I'm, he did it in a kind way. Gonna, we're going to do this quietly so we don't bring shame onto you or your family or, or my family, and, and we'll, we'll take care of this. And, but then an angel visits Joseph and says, no, Joseph, <laughs> she's not lying. Well, he's got to believe her now because an angel's visited him, so he can't discount her story and saying, hey, angel didn't visit you, but it visited me. So now he's been visited by angels. Angels have been everywhere. And he's like, okay, I believe this. The marriage is still on, and their life moves forward. It was quite along into their pregnancy, and the census was called, and they had to go to Bethlehem, the hometown. And census, they get counted for, they figure out how their taxes are going to work, and, uh, um, and so they go on this journey. They didn't go to their own area. Uh, there's different reasons for that. Probably one, they were ready to get away from out of town, out of all the gossiping, because I'm sure not everyone else believed that an angel really visited Mary. And so they go on this journey. It's a long journey. And they go to Bethlehem. Now, we often heard that the world in this, uh, she went to Bethlehem, couldn't find a place, there was no place in the inn, and that it's a story about the world turning their back on God, saying, no, there's no room in the inn. But I want to tell you that I think the story is something bigger. Because when we look at the gospel, when you're reading the gospel readings, you want to ask certain questions. One of the questions you want to ask is, what is the author's intent in telling us this story? And the intent throughout the gospels is to reveal to us the nature of God. Now, the scripture in doing so often reveals our nature, but it's mostly about the nature of God and the purposes of how God moves. So it, I don't think it's a story about how we turn our back on God but about how God shows up in the dark places, in the places that we would rather forget, in the places, whether they're places elsewhere or in ourselves, that this is about God showing up. And even unholy, as we might call them, moments, showing up in the dark corners of our life. So Mary and Joseph, they go on this journey to Bethlehem. So other towns, they, may, they could have gone... But they go to Bethlehem, and Bethlehem is not a destination point. This isn't New York City, it's not L.A., it's not even Orlando. Um, it's, it's out of the way. It's, it's a, a small, uh, as we would call a podunk town. Small, out of the way, there are no hotels. And so there's a question, if there are no hotels, what is this bit about no room in the inn? When it came time for Mary to deliver the baby, as the Greek actually unpacks this, Luke, Luke's text says this, She wrapped him in cloth and laid him in a corn crib, as there was no room in the guest room. Guest room. So you heard that right. No room in the guest room. And, and so Luke does not say there was no room in the inn. Luke has a different Greek word for inn. It's a um, pandeion, which uh, trots out in the parable of the Good Samaritan. The one that he uses here is a cataluma, and it's the same word that it talks about when Jesus goes to the upper room where they have the Last Supper. 
similar word. So it's a guest room, a guest room of a house. In Bethlehem, there were many caves in, in there. I don't know if, if anybody here has ever gone or anyone on line has been to Bethlehem. It's pretty neat, but you go out in these fields and you can imagine where the, the shepherds saw the angels come in. But you see these different caves and the houses used to be up against them. And what they would do is they would put their animals in the cave portion to protect them from theft, protect them from other wild animals devouring their uh, domesticated animals. And uh, um, the houses would be there. And so when Mary and Joseph were going to Bethlehem for the census, they would have alerted family somehow and say, hey, uh, we're coming, do you have a room? But the problem is the census is going, so they were packed. All the families and distant relatives that they know, their houses are full. But they found a way to make room for them. They said, well, we have this pop-up camper in the garage. <laughs> we have this cave. And uh, this is where you can stay. Now, the family, they would have moved the animals out so uh, they wouldn't get trampled on or, and, or step in anything. And, and, uh, but you still might be thinking, but they still put a pregnant woman in the cave. Why would they do that? Well, it's all out of kosher laws. Uh, Mary's about to deliver, I mean, like about to deliver uh, any moment, uh, taxi cab type of delivery sort of thing happening here. And because of all the issues that happen when one is delivering a baby, um, you, you know, kosher, don't want the meats and cheeses to touch, and, and so we have to keep everything uh, separate. And so Mary, in the best situation that, that this family could find, would go, we can put you in the cave, in the, in the, uh, in the stable. So this is the best they could do, but they made room. I think it's a story we can relate to about family doing the best we can to make room for an unexpected guest. It's a story about a God showing us life. It's about God showing up in the strangest of places and, and how we can embrace this God. I like, as Dr. Witherington said, Jesus came as he did to make it clear that no one, and I hear this, that no one and no place, however humble, was beneath his dignity, was beneath God's dignity. In every age and stage of life, he would hallow and save and sanctify. So many times we think that we have to clean up. You ever have uh, guests? It used to be that if guests showed up, you were always prepared. My, my parents grew up in a, a time when we'd always have something available uh, for the guests if they came by, unexpected guests. Now it's like, oh, no, someone's here at the door. What do I do? Do you pretend they're there or not? We've got little ring doorbells. Now we can see. Oh, nope, I'm answering that. And uh, um, I've never done that. So, um, my kids always knocking outside, let me in. No, I don't see you there. Um, I know you can see me. Um, no, we, we, our house might not be ready, so we get a little embarrassed. So we just kind of creak our head out, hey, <laughs> company. Um, but we, do we make room and space for it? We get embarrassed uh, because of our, our, the humbleness of our nature. But here's the beautiful thing about God is that God is not embarrassed by us. Not in, embarrassed of our condition. He says, let me step into you, your situation and the uncomfortable places and the places that you feel that you don't think you're worthy of me. The places that maybe other people said, oh, you're not worthy. It's sort of like that whole idea in churches. We always tell people, oh, you can't, don't wear your hat, don't cuss. You can't say that. You can't make that joke there in church. Well, what's the difference between in here and out there? And the difference is what we make it. That it's just as holy out there as it is in here. And I don't mean that for purification things, but it's just saying God is there. There's no place that God is not. And he wants to be with us and to sit. And he's not embarrassed by the darkness and the brokenness. As a matter of fact, he just wants to bring light to us, not to ju judge us or condemn us. We're always afraid if God sees that unholy mess of our life that he's going to bring out the divine thumb and go. Plink. But it's not true. He's like, no, let me embrace you. Let me sit with you in this. We're challenged today. We, when we meet Jesus and we, we start to invite him in, we make room. And uh, we might put him in the garage, but he's not going to stay out there. He's going to sneak in and get on the couch. And then he's going to start rearranging furniture. And first we're going to be uncomfortable with it. But then we're going to discover, oh, we like this arrangement. But the thing is, we keep trying to hide that one closet where we shove all the stuff in. Don't look at that. Jesus, no, let me come in. See, today, that closet, it's like over flooding. This 2020 has been just 
miserable. We're full of anxiety and, and anger and frustration and fear and, and the uncertainty of it all. And we're just, we're ready for it to be in our rear view mirror. But a part of us thinks it's going to be like the rear view mirror in Jurassic Park when the Tyrannosaurus Rex is right behind the Jeep. You know that part? That's what we feel like 2021 is going to be looking at 2020. But we want to get far enough out in front of it. Go, no, let's get. And that's what Jesus says. Yeah, let me ride in this Jeep with you. I'm right there with you. He wants to be in that midst of our frustration. I know. It doesn't always feel. Some people have talked about not feeling like hey, Christmas is different. It's uncomfortable. I, I get it. I'm used to seeing elk, you know, shoulder to shoulder. I like that. Not for ego, just I like being in it. But here's the thing. If we wait for the feeling to invite Jesus to come in, we're, we're never going to find that opportunity. Jesus says, no, let me, just make some room. And that room could be, Jesus, I don't feel good today. I don't feel like wishing anybody a Merry Christmas. I don't feel like saying Happy Holidays. I don't feel like wearing red. <sighs> but I really feel like having you in my life. And she's like, yeah, that's what I'm about. Let's be a part of that. Be honest with Jesus in your anxiety. Let him sit there. Make room for him. And all you have to do to make room is, Jesus, I got this little bit of garage I got right here. It's a little dark. It's a little dank. It's a little stinky. Um, would you come in? And he says, yeah, I'll freshen it up. We're people in need of Jesus to come in our lives, light up our hidden places, our dark caves and broken places. This Christmas, let's be like the first family and make room for Jesus and let him be born in you this day. Amen. We light the Christ candle to remind us that the light of the world was born this night. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You, O Lord, have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is called Emmanuel, for in him God is with us. The are going to come down now, and we're going to light their candles, and they're going to share that light with you. And... Um, as we do this, uh, we'll give you instructions when to stand and when to raise.
Merry Christmas. Well, as you go out tonight, make room for God in your lives. Remember to go out and bless one another. Take the joy of Jesus Christ in your life and share that love and joy with everyone you meet. Go with his peace. Amen.